I was in Namibia and I was talking we, on the UN operation there. We had deployed engineers. And I was talking with the telecommunications guy because that's my natural interest. His name was uh, Roger Banks and he was the, at that time the head of the UN field communications force that supported deployed missions. So I asked him about telecommunications opportunities coming up, <laughs> uh, operations that he could see that might come up in the next couple of years, what, was he, what were his thoughts on how the telecommunications needs might be met. And uh, we developed a relationship. Uh, in my own time, like you, uh, in my, on my own money, at one time I went through New York and stayed with him, saw him, uh, helped him with some things, just, just personally. And uh, so we had quite a relationship. So Roger would uh, communicate with me personally about possible opportunities for national deployments. Um, that's all background that Roger might not thank me for telling anybody now. It's a long time ago, so please forgive me, Roger. But yes, we used to talk quite openly as friends. In uh, 1989, the Paris conference was being held. Uh, at, they were to discuss uh, Cambodia. Cambodia, of the different nations that Roger had mentioned to me, was one that was of particular interest to Australia. The others were not, for strategic reasons and selfish reasons, as opposed to the humanitarian wanting to save, help the world. Cambodia was actually in our zone of influence, and we were concerned with it being unstable, and any problems it might have, consequences for us, and so on. So it was of interest. And the Paris conference was being held in 89. Uh, a foreign minister was attending it. The UN was concerned because a couple of agendas were going down. Um, the French were running a particular agenda as to what outcome they wanted from the conference. They were hosting it. They were paying for it. Um, the civil war in Cambodia had involved superpowers. Every guerrilla army, as was the, the, the state of play in that, that era, every guerrilla army had a foreign sponsor. So the Khmer Rouge was sponsored by China. So we had China involved. Um, Army Nationale Sihanouk was being sponsored by France. When I say sponsored, I mean mentored, supported, uh, relied on them. They spoke for them in the international forums uh, and so on. So Army Nationale was linked to France. Uh, Khmer Rouge were linked to China. Uh, Khmer People's, uh, KPN LAF, was linked to America. Um, the state of Cambodia, which was the government of the day, all these others have previously been governments of the day, the government of the day was the state of Cambodia and that was sponsored by Russia. So we didn't have a discussion with four Khmer leaders, we had a discussion involving four superpowers. So Paris conference was quite complex and there were lots of different agendas, but because it was in our region, we cared. The UN was concerned that they might be embarrassed that these various superpowers would know more about the situation on the ground than they. So the UN called for a fact-finding mission, uh, led by General Vadset, who was then the head of the force in the Sinai. Uh, I became quite friendly with him, uh, we worked together very well and uh, on that mission uh, we were just to assess the situation on the ground. So that was the first involvement of any Australian soldier in the Cambodian uh, period. It was participation in the fact-finding mission August 89, August, September 89 about then. And the purpose for the fact-finding mission was to report back to the Paris conference which was being held in October, November, December, around there. So the the actual uh, conduct of the of the operation, the fact finding mission, was quite successful. Uh, as I said, the Vietnamese were still occupied Cambodia at that time, and uh, they were offering to withdraw, and they asked for uh, us and the, uh, we and the Paris Conference to um, witness their withdrawal. So we thought that was going to be our deployment. I thought that was a logical thing for them to do. I thought the world would want to know that the Vietnamese had left, genuinely left, and not pretended to leave and still be controlling the place with puppets or whatever. I thought it was in the world's interest. I was wrong. The world uh, didn't choose to let the Vietnamese off the hook that easily. And for whatever reason, that's my deduction, but for whatever reason, the world refused the Vietnamese invitation to uh, uh, monitor their withdrawal from Cambodia. And you could work out why one day, that'd be an interesting question. I've got some thoughts, but I don't know. But So I had prepared, uh, in our own planning cycles back in Australia, I had prepared 
to be asked to support a monitoring force to observe the withdrawal and verify the withdrawal of the Vietnamese in late 89. Never happened, but we prepared. The next, uh, the next in involvement was the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade coming back from the Paris Conference with a, with a determination to play a role in resolving the Cambodian problem or the problems in Cambodia. And uh, if you know the personality, it was Gareth Evans, an incredible guy, whatever your politics, he was an incredible guy. And uh, he was one of the most uh, intelligent and uh, determined foreign ministers that I know of that we've had, uh, in my time anyway. And uh, I had a lot of respect for him, but he came back with a determination to play a role in this. So I was uh, asked for again because I'd been on the earlier mission, and this cumulative experience is sort of making me the man, I guess. And uh, so I'm asked for uh, again to be loaned to the Department of Foreign Affairs for February 1990 to go and do a, uh, an Australian fact finding mission. So there's a fact finding mission, UN. Then there was the Australian fact-finding mission in uh, February of uh, uh, 90. The political activity, the world political activity that was paralleling these was the Paris Conference. And then there was what was called the GIM, the Jakarta Interim Meeting. And you can find all, uh, more about these things. And Gareth was preparing for the Jakarta Interim Meeting when he sent us off in February. We subsequently went with him to the Jakarta Interim Meeting, but by then, we'd seriously developed a body of knowledge about the problem. And I don't know that Australia's ever approached a peacekeeping exercise like that before. And it is because it, and, and there's more, uh, uh, before Australia actually, uh, before the UN would agree to sponsor uh, an interim administration there. And um, the member, the other member states that were involved in the conflict would agree to withdraw, as in the, the superpowers are already linked and part of the problem, and to negotiate the isolation of their interests. Then they had to encourage the UN to intervene, and Australia played a major role in both those initiatives. Um, and the credit for a lot of that goes to Gareth. It obviously goes to his, the government of which he was a part as well, because they supported him in all aspects. And what, you, what, you, what I'm describing is a, an Australia incorporated approach to doing business, which was lovely. It's fantastic. Um, you had the Defence Department and Foreign Affairs working together towards a national agenda like I've not witnessed before. Obviously, obviously I don't mean to do them any discredit. They, no doubt they work well. Ramsey is another recent example of how well they do it now. Mind you, same personalities. Nick Warner was a vital part of everything I'm talking about. There. Nick Warner was on the fringes and then involved in the execution of the whole Cambodia thing. And uh, we all grew up a lot in that, that little period of 89 through 93. Uh, the selection of the force commander, uh, having the foreign affairs agree that it was a national goal to have an Australian lead the military. It's, with due apologies to my colleagues in foreign affairs, it's a very understandable foreign affairs position to say, hell no. We don't want that job. What if something goes wrong? What if Australia gets... Why don't we take that risk? Why don't we just be boss of the Feed the Children campaign? Hey, why don't we teach left-handed people how to write? You know? That's a much better, softer... I'm, being, I'm mocking them a little bit, but I can understand them choosing a softer option. But now they hardened up, and they agreed that we could establish serious profile in the region by leading that. And... Um, it was then our problem was to find a suitable candidate. Um, in Sanderson, they found the man of Athens and Sparta. You know, they found exactly what they needed. And uh, he, he represented Australia, as did all the other Australians that were involved in leadership positions. Uh, he, they did extraordinary jobs.